Hello and welcome to World Baptist Church and an edited recording of our service held on the 8th of May 2022. Let me read to you from Revelation chapter 1 and verses 4 to 6 and then we're going to sing another one of my favourite Easter hymns. I'm sort of a bit retro this morning, all right? It's low in the grave he lay, and up from the grave that uh, he arose. So, first of all then from uh, John. To the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you who, from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory now and forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We stand to sing, Lo, in the grave he lay. Heavenly Father, it is good to celebrate a risen Saviour. Christ arose. We thank you that death is defeated, the grave has been vanquished. We pray that we, by your Spirit, may know the presence of the risen Jesus among us as we meet together in fellowship and in worship to proclaim the glories of your name. We pray that through your word you would speak to us, your people, that you would grow us in our understanding of who you are, in all your splendor and majesty in your lordship, and that you would help us to understand what you are calling us to do and to be as we seek to serve you, our risen Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, I was just going to say where I put the open the book book. I've got it in my hand. Good. Yes, you may wonder why people are dressed up shepherds and you're thinking, gosh, is this going to be a retake on the nativity um, in May? Well, no, not quite. What we're going to do, 
once I can find my bits and pieces here, is give you an example. Uh, we were talking last week, weren't we, about going into St. Mark's School as the Open the Book team and having those opportunities. Um, what I'm going to do, um, I'll do the introduction just as if we are in school, and then I'll be reading the script and this fine body of Oscar-nominated as actors um, will be performing for us, ably assisted by Kelly. What's going on behind me here? Is David being cheeky, all right? If he is, say, he's behind you, all right? Just, just shout that up and, and, I'll, and, and then I'll set Sue on him. All right, here we go. So, um, imagine us now, we're in a, a, you're a class, not just a class, you're a whole school assembly and you're all sitting nicely and you're behaving and you see me come to the front and you all your eyes are upon me in awe. Are you there? <laughs> Quite. Well, we need, oh, do, do, I think we need some helpers. Uh, we need some helpers, do we? Are they not, do we not have helpers? Because we did... We need the fishermen to show the nets. Oh, how many fishermen do we need? One will do. Any, any volunteers to be, a, uh, to be one of our fishermen? Jenny is volunteering, but if there's anybody else, not that I've got anything against Jenny, but, <laughs> you know, don't feel it has to be Jenny, but being as you're there already. Okay, so Jenny is going to be our impromptu actor. Um, so she, has, she hasn't rehearsed this. To be fair, neither has Sandra, so this could be interesting. <laughs> Because uh, in the team on Wednesday, we had folk from other churches as well. And I said, well, that's the story that I'm preaching on next Sunday, so let's do it next Sunday. And so Sandra immediately volunteered, volunteered. To, vo volunteered her services <laughs> straight, straight away when I looked her in the eyes and said, you will, won't you, Sandra? Yes, yes. So I'm in school, and I'm referring back now to the last time we were there. Do you remember, in the last story, we left Jesus rather wet. He had been baptized by John in the river, and we learned that God said that Jesus was someone very special. Well, today our story is a bit watery too, and also a bit fishy. So, let's open the book and read the story Jesus' special friends. Jesus grew up in a place called Galilee, where there was a large and beautiful lake. And it was there that he began the work God gave him to do. God is like a king, and he wants all of you to be part of his kingdom, to love him and to love each other. Do you know, people liked to hear Jesus talk. In fact, one morning, the crowd was so huge that Jesus was nearly pushed into the sea. Excuse me, could I borrow your boat uh, for a while? Do you know, the fisherman's name was Peter. Of course, it's doing me no good. I was out all night and didn't catch a thing. Not a That wasn't in the script. <laughs> Jesus climbed into the boat. Peter rowed it a little way from shore. And from there, Jesus talked to the crowd. When he had finished, Jesus sent the people home. And then he turned to Peter. Let's go a little further out. I'd like to catch some fish. Ah, oh, Peter tossed back his head and laughed. I told you, my men and I were out all night. We caught nothing. Jesus, he didn't say a word. He just smiled and looked across the lake. So Peter sailed to the deepest part of the lake, and there he dropped his fishing nets <coughs> over the side. 
It says here, it took no time at all. The nets started pulling and jerking and stretching. And it was all Peter Duke to keep the boat from tipping over. And they rowed to him fast, the friends that were nearby, as fast as they could. Then, all together, the men pulled on the nets, and the fish came tumbling and slapping onto the decks of both boats and the floor. There were red fish and blue fish, and not just one or two fish. So many, in fact, that the boats would have sunk had the fishermen not rowed quickly back to shore. <laughs> Peter looked at the fish. Peter looked at his friends. Then Peter looked at Jesus and fell to his knees trembling. Jesus shook his head and smiled. Don't be scared. God has given me a lot of work to do. <coughs> I need helpers. Helpers like you, your friends. Once you fish for fish, but from now on you'll be fishing for people and helping me to bring them to God. Then Jesus stepped out of the boat and walked away across the shore. Peter and his friends watched him go. They looked at the fish. They looked at each other. Then they dropped their nets and left their boats behind and raced off to follow Jesus. Now, Peter was a good fisherman. He knew that the fish weren't there until Jesus spoke. Peter knew it was a miracle, and so he followed Jesus, and that changed his life forever. Although we cannot see Jesus today, Christians will tell you that they follow Jesus, and it also changes their lives. Close your eyes and think about the miracle that Peter and the fishermen saw, and imagine for a moment just how amazed they were at what Jesus had done. Now I'm going to say a prayer. And if you want to make it your own prayer, just say Amen at the end after me. Dear God, thank you that Peter had friends to call on when he needed help with all those fish. Thank you too that Jesus needed friends like Peter to help him tell people all about you. Please help each of us to be such a good friend too. Amen. And that, my good friends, is open the book. And it's the fun that we have when we go into school. We were there last, uh, when was it? Uh, Wednesday morning. And uh, after we'd all packed up and picked up all the f fish, <laughs> um, one of the teachers brought back a, a girl, what was she, about seven or eight? Uh, because she'd said something to her teacher, and so the teacher brought her to, to speak to us. And she was just full, oh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed that, she said to us. So we went home, as you can imagine, with a, a smile on our faces, with a sense of thanksgiving to God. Thus ends part one of the service. Uh, it's going to take a while to clear things up. <laughs> but before we do so, Frank, have you got the reading there printed out? Hang on then. He's going to read the original script. Ah, now then. I'm reading from uh, Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Jesus calls his first disciples. 
One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding round him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they'd done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats upon shore, left everything, and followed him. Okay. Well, something much more serious uh, now, of course. And uh, I've got something here from the Bible Society um, telling us about their work in Ukraine at the moment. And after I finish, we'll watch a little uh, video um, that's come from Bible Society from people there in Ukraine. It's about how folk in Ukraine are turning to the Bible for hope. This is what the uh, piece of, uh, from Bible Society says. Despite the war in Ukraine, Bible mission there not only continues, but has actually expanded. The Bible Society leader in Ukraine, Alexander, says that people fearing for their own lives and the lives of loved ones are turning to the Lord in ever greater numbers. From Kiev, he said this, Churches are filled with people wanting to pray and find comfort. People call us and visit daily, desperate to get Bibles. But our stock for the entire year is almost gone. People are taking whatever we have. One pastor pleaded for Bibles that were damaged or even copies with pages missing. Alexander added that the Bible Society team in Kiev has been given a special military pass to travel around the city to distribute basic aid and the scriptures. He sent us a video of him in the back of a van packed with children's scriptures. He describes the Bible worker at the vehicle's wheel as a hero, as he risks his life driving through streets, delivering Bibles. Other Bible Society workers are in southern Ukraine, delivering scriptures and basic aid to people in hospitals and bomb shelters. As missiles explode around them, these people clutch scriptures just handed to them. Through God's word, they find strength and hope. The words of Psalm 31 have become a mantra for Ukrainian people. Here's verses 13 to 14. Terror on every side. They conspire against me and plot to take my life. But I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. Uh, discovering the importance of Psalm 31 for people, apparently the, the, as Christians are reading it every day and praying it through, I've actually printed out uh, at home Psalm 31 in different versions and I'm using it as a basis for my own prayers in solidarity with the prayers and the people, the Christians in Ukraine. So that's something we could all uh, take on board at least once a week, is to read Psalm 31 and lift the thoughts that occur to you as you read it to God in prayer. The Bible Society team in Ukraine, thank you for your prayers. Please pray the fighting will end soon and that more people will find hope through the scriptures. There are many agencies providing humanitarian aid, which is so important. 
but for scriptures, people in Ukraine are relying on the generosity, um, particularly of Bible Society supporters. So let's watch that video now of that um, van driver that is referred to by Alexander, and we'll see him in the back of the van with a stock of scriptures. Now we have uh, our, our hero from West Ukraine who will drive to, to different places. We have a fire burning in uh, in in uh, cities where they will take to hospitals to bomb rooms uh, to people who are in need who would like to read kids and women uh, children bible and as well here a new testament so pray for this operation now the guy will drive today has been a very difficult night kiwi is under attack all the time now we have like small break, no siren uh, goes. We are standing, we are sharing living bread and physical bread and God are with us. Thanks that you also standing with us in this very crucial moment. Thank you, God blessing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that your word is reaching more and more Ukrainian people in the crisis, in the war, in the fighting. Lord, it's hard for us to imagine what it would be like for us being there, and our hearts are torn when we see the continuing images and stories in the news. But we thank you for the Bible Society in Ukraine, the way that they have risen to the challenge Thank you for the generosity of supporters and being able to buy the New Testaments, the children's Bibles, even old scriptures. Lord, we pray that through your word, you will continue to speak hope and life and encouragement into the lives of people. We pray for our meeting this evening at St. George's Community Center. Grant to us through the presence of your spirit, a unity in prayer and grant that through our prayers a difference will be made we pray again for the war to end soon we pray for schemes of evil to be thwarted we long for peace with justice to reign hear our prayer in the name of christ the prince of peace amen and in our prayer points, I'll just pick out uh, a few things, but also then some uh, the news that we've received recently from uh, Judy Cook in Thailand. And we're asked to begin by thanking God that he is able to do and ask all and more than we can imagine. We've seen that illustrated in our little story this morning. Um, Peter and the fishermen could not have imagined the catch that they got when they did what Jesus told them to do. God is able to do more than we can ask or imagine. And the thought often occurs to me that when I push my prayers to the limits of my faith in asking, I remember this verse and God says, I can top that. <laughs> you know, I can do more than you can ask for, pray um, or imagine. And he calls us then to follow him wherever we are. There's an important meeting coming up this Tuesday um, as uh, the church leaders, along with the Parkland leaders and people from Webnet, the local association, um, talk about um, seeking God's will for the future of the Parkland church over there. So appreciate your prayers for that on Tuesday evening. Um, and speaking of Parklands, there's the pop-up cafe that they're holding next Sunday on the 14th. And then there's the World Leaders Meeting here uh, on Thursday on the 12th. Let's pray together. For your power that is at work within us, Lord, we thank you. And there are times when we do not know how to pray as we ought, but you have promised that in those moments you gift us with your spirit who leads us into prayers beyond our knowing, beyond our understanding, beyond our imagining. Thank you for that reminder that you are able to do far more than all we can think or ask or imagine. We commit to you our friends in Parklands Community Church. Think of the uh, meeting this Tuesday that your spirit would lead us and guide us as we discuss things together. We pray for the pop-up cafe that will be held next Saturday. We thank you for the um, encouragements that have come on those Saturdays with people from the community pitching up and staying and enjoying a few hours together and for all the opportunities that that creates to be able to chat with them. 
And for ourselves, as uh, will we pray for ourselves as we meet uh, as leaders on Thursday and as we continue to look at the agenda before us and as the, the future um, of your, your will for this church. We pray for Andre and Dushi in Albania. They ask us to pray for people who are sick to get healed. People in need to have enough food. That God will provide for them and for their housing situation. We ask to pray for Irvis, a young man from Drita Ibotis Church who starts Bible school in September. That God will provide the fees. We remember Pete and Louise in Bangladesh. Pray you'll keep them in good health. And we pray that you will prosper the work that you have called them to do there. We pray for Dan and Philippa Munde in Nepal. And we pray also for Judy Cook. We thank you for the time that she was able to spend with us that Sunday a few weeks ago. Since she's gone back, they've had uh, COVID in, the, in Hope Home. And if you've uh, read the, uh, the letter, you will know about that. So, Lord, we pray for the remaining staff and children who are still COVID positive, that they would recover well and soon. We pray for the three children who, at the time of writing, were remaining COVID negative, that they too would stay healthy, along with the remaining staff, including Judy herself. We pray for the SDSU team to continue to serve communities well and to stay as protected and safe as they can. We pray for the ongoing spiritual growth among staff and children at Hope Home. At the end of this letter, Judy says, thank you for your amazing encouragement and support over the visits whilst in the UK and for the ongoing ministries of SDSU and Hope Home in Thailand. Your partnership with BMS World Mission is greatly appreciated and valued. And then she writes these words that are intended as a blessing. So hear these words as a blessing now that come in the power of the Spirit. May you be overwhelmed by the power of God's love and care for each one of us. And may his presence be very near to you in whatever circumstances you are facing. Judy signs off, God bless, with love and sincere, sincere thanks. Lord, hear these our prayers as we bring them in the strong and wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, I was thinking back um, to the late 1980s, early 1990s when I started this sermon because I was remembering a particular lady in my first church in Tonopandi. I remember uh, Sophie well. She was an elderly member of my first church who once gave me quite freely and, and asked for advice on how best to bring up my boys. I once referred to them in her hearing as the kids. Mr. Bayliss, she said, your children are not young goats. They are boys. You got the idea of Sophie? Now, she herself had no experience of bringing children up, and as far as I know, had never been involved in any form of childcare. But she considered herself an authority on the subject and let me know, in very Sophie terms, where Helen and I were going wrong in bringing up the boys. I managed to maintain a veneer of pastoral politeness. You might get used to that look if you annoy me, all right? Uh, of pastoral politeness. But underneath, I was beginning to simmer. Thoughts like, what on earth? What a cheek. And I'm glad to say my boys never did benefit from her authoritative counsel. She also had plenty to say on how I should go about being a pastor. And in all of my mention of other ministers, I have never passed on her advice in that department either. <laughs> I have, however, passed on a few tips on how to cope with such as she in the church. 
Now, last week I said that if you wanted to take up fishing, then you would do well to get a copy of the book Fishing for Dummies. Has anybody gone out and bought or ordered on Amazon Fishing for Dummies? Well, I won't get any... Re oh, I was hoping for some commission on that. <laughs> and I also said that perhaps you would do well to talk to someone experienced who knows what it is they're doing, and that if you were going to go fishing on the Sea of Galilee, then Simon and his brother Andrew would wonderfully fit the bill. What they didn't know about fishing on the Lake of Galilee simply probably just wasn't worth knowing. So, can you put yourselves for a moment in Peter's shoes, or Simon as he's still more better known at this stage in the story? How would you feel if you'd been out fishing all night, caught nothing, only then to be told by a non-fisherman, a carpenter to boot, what to do. Now then, teachers, one of the high points of your term, I know, <laughs> is a parent's evening. Have you ever had a parent who has never taught one child for one day, let alone 30 or more of them for many years in the class, telling you what you're doing wrong and how you should be doing it better? Well, I, I've been a school governor and I've heard the reports from teachers who've had experiences just like that. You get the picture. So, let on. How do you think Peter might have felt? When Jesus told him to put out into deep water and let down the nets. Let's zoom out for a moment. Scan the wider scene. Comparing the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, it becomes clear that the calling of the disciples and their response took place over a period of weeks, if not months. And uh, commentaries say that this incident here recorded in Luke's Gospel is probably a year on from the calling of the disciples there in John's Gospel. So it, 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 it's happened over time. And some of them um, had already been disciples of John the Baptist. God was already at work in their lives. But they still had their jobs to do. They still had their families to support. So Simon and Andrews and others were still going fishing. So as I say, getting to know Jesus took place gradually. They, they needed to weigh him up. Who was he? Could he really be trusted? Was he simply just too good to be true? Etc, etc, etc. Now, before this incident of catching all this fish, Luke has recorded um, the spreading fame of Jesus. Luke chapter 4 and verses 31 to 40. So, let me uh, read that for you. And uh, you'll notice in it something significant um, in the life of Simon Peter. So, Luke 4 and verse 31. Then Jesus went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. Oh, in that crowd, probably there was Simon Peter and, and others. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet! Jesus said sternly, Come out of him! Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, What words are these? With authority and power he gives orders to impure spirits and they come out and the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Do you get the picture? Everyone's talking about Jesus. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon which indicates that they had met before. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of illness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. So, you see, 
This story of the fish has got a context. The context is everyone talking about Jesus. The things that he said, the things that he's done. And for Simon, he's witnessed the miracle of his mother-in-law being uh, healed just like that. Jesus, therefore, has already served notice on them, as we compare the Gospels, that he expects them to be his disciples. So the scene is now set for Galilee. The shore of the lake and the surrounding hills made for a natural amphitheatre. If you've ever been to the Holy Land, you may have seen it. I've not, but uh, this is what they say. And being in a boat, the water would help carry a speaker's voice even further. So Jesus' voice would have been carried for the thousands gathered to hear. And Simon, I suspect, heard every word, even if he was mending his nets at the time. He would have been surely impressed. That sense of authority that oozed from Jesus when he spoke. So Jesus speaking comes to an end. He's finished and he dismisses the crowds. Did Jesus then sit quietly in the boat, glad of a chance to rest while the fishermen went about their business? Well, we're not told. But I think we can safely assume that Jesus knew that they were disappointed. Even perhaps disgruntled not to have caught anything. Their body language, the tone of their conversation would not have been lost on Jesus. Now, they'd done everything right. They'd fished at night, which is when you should. They'd fished in shallow water at night, all according for fishing on the Lake of Galilee for dummies. They'd done it by the book. They should have had a catch. The moment came when Jesus spoke up and his voice carried loud and clear across the water. Simon! You can imagine the pause. Peter looks up expectantly, listening. Put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Okay. Simon can't quite believe his ears. Can you imagine the quick glances exchanged secretly between the other fishermen? What's Simon going to say to that? Was he going to let fly and tell Jesus what he thought of such a ridiculous suggestion? And can you hear at least the beginnings of a protest in what Luke has recorded in his first words? Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Jesus just looked at him. He clearly expected Simon to do as he had suggested. Apprentice disciples do what their rabbis tell them. And so the embryonic protest just dies on the lips of Peter. And captured by this man's extraordinary presence and authority, he surrenders and defiant every instinct forged by years of hardened experience, he, well, perhaps reluctantly, obeys, puts out into the deep. He says, because you say so. Implications, anybody else had told me that and I would have told them where to go in no uncertain terms. But because you say so, I will let down the net. And we all know what happens next. Now then, this story, I want to suggest, is quite radical and packs a punch. And not everyone will like it. Now why do I say that? Well, not because some people stubbornly refuse to believe in miracles. We live in an age where it is cool to be spiritual. 
what is a spirituality that, if you like, is customized to the change in beliefs and likes and dislikes of the individual. It's tailor-made for you. It doesn't tell you what you can and can't do. It's designed to make you feel good about yourself. Recently, I was reminded of a, uh, a book, a commentary on uh, Isaiah chapter 6, where um, Isaiah the prophet, confronted by his sin, says, Woe is me. And it pointed out that the modern gospel very often is, Wow is me. You've got to remember, we do in here with our God. The spirituality people will go for more often than not is, if you like, morally neutral. It's a spirituality that knows its place and sticks to it. So, when Jesus is in the boat talking God, talking spirituality and all that stuff, he at least deserves a hearing. It's his area of expertise, after all, not like the teachers of the law. Teaching us how to pray. Teaching us to give generously. Teaching us to do to others what you would like them to do to you. And so forth. Fine. But, but, don't tell me how to run my life. Don't tell me how to run my business. Don't tell me who I can and can't sleep with. Don't tell me how to do my job. Don't, Jesus, if I might say so respectfully, try and teach me how to fish. Many today can only cope with a Jesus who doesn't poke his nose in where it's not wanted. But not a Jesus who assumes the right to boss every area of our lives. They don't want a Jesus who invades our right to autonomy, who infringes our right to decide for ourselves what's right and what's wrong. How dare this Jesus question our right to self-determination? You see, that's what Jesus is doing with Simon in this story. He was the expert fisherman. Jesus wasn't. Yet Jesus tells him how to fish. Simon here, in his journey from Simon to Peter, needed to learn an absolutely basic and vital lesson of that discipleship. Jesus is Lord. And there is no area in our lives that can be ruled off limits to him. Even those areas where we know best, or think we do. Paul, right into the church in Colossians, says this, Colossians 2, verses 6 to 7. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, so go on receiving him as Lord, with no limits put to it. But I think there's perhaps something else going on in this story at the deeper level. He's already heard Jesus tell him, some months before, I'll make you a fisher of men, of people. I wonder, did Peter harbour doubts about that? How's that work then? How's Jesus going to do that? And did Jesus really seriously appreciate what he'd taken on in Simon? He wasn't cut out for doing that sort of thing. You know, if he went up to witness to somebody, he'd immediately offend them. He'd say something wrong. 
Could he actually deliver? Could Jesus actually change Simon to Peter? I wonder, have you ever harbored doubts about what God seems to be calling you to do? When God has told you to put out into the deep and let down your nets, and every instinct you've got says no. As that catch was hauled up, as the boats began to sink under their weight, what was going on in Simon's head? Did the fact that they had caught nothing when they should have caught something have something to do with this man from Nazareth? So, was the fact that they caught nothing the first miracle? Don't often think of it in those terms. Had there been supernatural intervention that had warned the fish off? <laughs> they should have caught something, but they didn't. Just as then, as much as the fact that they then caught something when they should have caught nothing. Had not Simon witnessed two miracles? So, if Simon had any lingering doubts about the authority of this rabbi, Jesus from Nazareth, then with this catch of fish, they were extinguished. If Jesus can do that, teach me how to fish for fish, when he shouldn't have been able to, he can teach me to fish for men. I think that's the message that Jesus was driving home to Simon. See this miracle? Now believe me for the rest. It certainly touched Simon. He trembles, falls to his knees as he realizes the enormity of the implications of what had just happened. And he's not in a state of rebellion when he says, depart from me, I am a sinful man. Suddenly, the big divine picture has opened up in front of him. And he's overwhelmed. He's overawed. And he falls to his knees. He feels his unworthiness in the presence of this man. There is something of God about him. And for us, it's not just knowing about God is a holy God. Yes, we can all tick the box. But sensing that holiness is a vital and crucial element of our discipleship. But here before us in Jesus our Lord is someone extraordinary, authoritative. He is Lord. And he expects us to follow and obey. We recognize our unworthiness. We recognize the sinfulness of sin. Perhaps there have been times, are you on it now, on a parallel journey with Simon to Peter, discovering just who Jesus is. Is this a vital lesson that you need to take on board or a vital lesson you need to take on board again? In order to witness that miracle on that unforgettable day, Simon had to do as he was told, even though he harbored doubts about what Jesus had said. And then note the conclusion of the story in verse 11. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. Now think about it. They'd just won a fortune in the fisherman's lottery. <laughs> They'd never seen such a catch. Taking that to market, they could have retired on it. <laughs> and yet they were prepared to leave the biggest catch they'd ever had 
Somebody else might have benefited. They left it there. They followed him. Why? Because something bigger, something greater, something better was on offer than what was offered in that catch. That shows they were prepared to let Jesus be Lord. That they left that catch. Not looking back and followed him. Will you sacrifice your right to self-determination? Will you sacrifice your right to live as you please? It's a big ask. But Jesus asks it. Why? Well, because in Jesus, forgiveness is on the table. In Jesus, eternal life is on offer. Better than anything else we could come up with in the light of eternity. And as a form of response, we're going to sing uh, another older sort of hymn, but it's one that I've noticed has, uh, is enjoying a new uh, lease of life. It's all to Jesus, I surrender. Thank you. So we stand to sing. I surrender all. Do you know, Jesus first surrendered all for you and for me. I mean, if ever someone, you know, God asked his son to go out into the deep, into the darkest recesses of the wrath of God on the cross, Jesus surrendered all for the prize of winning you and me.
So in that sense, he is asking of us no more than he has already given to us. Only his giving is far greater than our giving. And so that brings us to our communion table where we recognize that surrender that Jesus gave to the will of his Father to shed his blood so for his body to be broken on that cross. Let me remind you of words written to the church in Corinth. I received from the Lord what Paul says, what I also passed on to you, how that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you. We thank you for what this bread represents, for what the cup represents, and the body and blood of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. And as we take it now, we pray that we might also receive you by faith. So that what this bread and cup represents may be a reality within our hearts, our minds, our souls, our spirits. Help us to glimpse yet more of what you surrendered on our behalf, that we might have life, our sins forgiven, eternal life guaranteed. Meet with us as round this table we come, for your glory and our good we pray. Amen. So our Lord took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. Sandra, could I ask you to serve that? And the cut bread is gluten free, the broken bread there uh, is not. Um, take the bread and as you receive it, so, so eat. Okay, would you like to serve this side? Thank you, Carrie. As the cup come round, we ask you to hold on to it that we might drink together. But as that is happening, perhaps you in prayer could be thinking of friends, family, whoever. Somebody that the Lord might be nudging you to be thinking of, praying for. Somebody who through now in your prayers you can fish for. That they might come to know Jesus. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, said Jesus. Drink it, all of you, in remembrance of me. sense the Lord saying something along the lines of, just as I looked at Peter and expected him to do what I said, so now I am looking at you. Will you do as I say? Thank you, our Father, for giving us your Son, and send in your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Equip us, we pray, with your Spirit, that we might play our part in finishing the work you came to do. And that's cue for us to sing our final song, There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son.
blessing, the blessing of God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit upon us and all those for whom this day we have love and care. Amen.